the man who would be king by Rudyard Kipling. Brother to a prince and fellow to a beggar if he be found worthy. The law, as quoted, lays down a fair conduct of life, and one not easy to follow. I have been fellow to a beggar again and again under circumstances which prevented either of us finding out whether the other was worthy. I have still to be brother to a prince, though I once came near to kinship with what might have been a veritable king and was promised the reversion of a kingdom army, law courts, revenue and policy all complete. But, today, I greatly fear that my king is dead, and if I want a crown I must go and hunt it for myself. The beginning of everything was in a railway train upon the road to Mao from Ajmer. There had been a deficit in the budget, which necessitated travelling, not second class, which is only half as dear as first class, but by intermediate, which is very awful indeed. There are no cushions in the intermediate class, and the population are either intermediate, which is Eurasian, or native, which for a long night journey is nasty, or loafer, which is amusing though intoxicated. Intermediates do not patronize refreshment rooms. They carry their food in bundles and pots, and buy sweets from the native sweetmeat sellers, and drink the roadside water. That is why in the hot weather intermediates are taken out of the carriages dead, and in all weathers are most properly looked down upon. My particular intermediate happened to be empty till I reached Nasir Abbot, when a huge gentleman in shirt sleeves entered, and, following the custom of intermediates, passed the time of day. He was a wanderer and a vagabond like myself, but with an educated taste for whiskey. He told tales of things he had seen and done, of out-of-the-way corners of the empire into which he had penetrated, and of adventures in which he risked his life for a few days' food. If India was filled with men like you and me, not knowing more than the crows where they'd get their next day's rations, it isn't seventy millions of revenue the land would be paying its seven hundred million, said he, and as I looked at his mouth and chin I was disposed to agree with him. We talked politics the politics of loaferdom that sees things from the underside where the lath and plaster is not smoothed off and we talked postal arrangements because my friend wanted to send a telegram back from the next station to Ajmer which is the turning-off place from the Bombay to the Mao line as you travel westward. My friend had no money beyond eight annas which he wanted for dinner, and I had no money at all, owing to the hitch in the budget before mentioned. Further, I was going into a wilderness where, though I should resume touch with the treasury, there were no telegraph offices. I was, therefore, unable to help him in any way. We might threaten a station master, and make him send a wire on tick, said my friend, but that'd mean inquiries for you and for me, and I've got my hands full these days. Did you say you are travelling back along this line within any days? Within ten, I said. Can't you make it eight, said he. Mine is rather urgent business. I can send your telegram within ten days if that will serve you, I said. I couldn't trust the wire to fetch him now I think of it. It's this way. He leaves Delhi on the 23D for Bombay. That means he'll be running through Ajmer about the night of the 23D. But I'm going into the Indian desert, I explained. Well and good, said he. You'll be changing at Merwar Junction to get into Jodhpur territory you must do that and he'll be coming through Merwar Junction in the early morning of the 24th by the Bombay Mail. Can you be at Merwar Junction on that time? Tun't be inconveniencing you because I know that there's precious few pickings to be got out of these central India states even though you pretend to be correspondent of the backwoodsmen. Have you ever tried that trick? I asked. Again and again, but the residents find you out, and then you get escorted to the border before you've time to get your knife into them. But about my friend here. I must give him a word o' mouth to tell him what's come to me or else he won't know where to go. I would take it more than kind of you if you was to come out of central India in time to catch him at Merwar Junction, and say to him he has gone south for the week. He'll know what that means. He's a big man with a red beard, and a great swell he is. You'll find him sleeping like a gentleman with all his luggage round him in a second-class compartment. But don't you be afraid. Slip down the window, and say he has gone south for the week, and he'll tumble. It's only cutting your time of stay in those parts by two days. I ask you as a stranger going to the west, 
he said with emphasis. Where have you come from, said I. From the east, said he, and I am hoping that you will give him the message on the square for the sake of my mother as well as your own. Englishmen are not usually softened by appeals to the memory of their mothers, but for certain reasons, which will be fully apparent, I saw fit to agree. It's more than a little matter, said he, and that's why I ask you to do it and now I know that I can depend on you doing it. A second-class carriage at Mare War Junction, and a red-haired man asleep in it. You'll be sure to remember. I get out at the next station, and I must hold on there till he comes or sends me what I want. I'll give the message if I catch him, I said, and for the sake of your mother as well as mine I'll give you a word of advice. Don't try to run the Central India States just now as the correspondent of the backwoodsman. There's a real one knocking about here, and it might lead to trouble. Thank you, said he simply, and when will the swine be gone? I can't starve because he's ruining my work. I wanted to get hold of the Degumber Raja down here about his father's widow, and give him a jump. What did he do to his father's widow, then? Filled her up with red pepper and slippered her to death as she hung from a beam. I found that out myself and I'm the only man that would dare going into the state to get hush money for it. They'll try to poison me, same as they did in Chorchamna when I went on the loot there. But you'll give the man at Mare War Junction my message. He got out at a little roadside station, and I reflected. I had heard, more than once, of men personating correspondents of newspapers and bleeding small native states with threats of exposure, but I had never met any of the caste before. They lead a hard life, and generally die with great suddenness. The native states have a wholesome horror of English newspapers, which may throw light on their peculiar methods of government and do their best to choke correspondents with champagne, or drive them out of their mind with four-in-hand barouches. They do not understand that nobody cares a straw for the internal administration of native states so long as oppression and crime are kept within decent limits, and the ruler is not drugged, drunk, or diseased from one end of the year to the other. Native states were created by Providence in order to supply picturesque scenery, tigers, and tall writing. They are the dark places of the earth full of unimaginable cruelty, touching the railway and the telegraph on one side, and, on the other, the days of Harun al Raskad. When I left the train I did business with divers kings, and in eight days passed through many changes of life. Sometimes I wore dress clothes and consorted with princes and politicals, drinking from crystal and eating from silver. Sometimes I lay out upon the ground and devoured what I could get, from a plate made of a flapjack and drank the running water, and slept under the same rug as my servant. It was all in a day's work. Then I headed for the great Indian desert upon the proper date, as I had promised, and the night mail set me down at Mare War Junction, where a funny little, happy-go-lucky, native-managed railway runs to Jodhpur. The Bombay mail from Delhi makes a short halt at Mare War. She arrived as I got in, and I had just time to hurry to her platform and go down the carriages. There was only one second class on the train. I slipped the window and looked down upon a flaming red beard, half covered by a railway rug. That was my man, fast asleep, and I dug him gently in the ribs. He woke with a grunt and I saw his face in the light of the lamps. It was a great and shining face. Tickets again, said he. No said I I am to tell you that he is gone south for the week. He is gone south for the week. The train had begun to move out. The red man rubbed his eyes. He has gone south for the week, he repeated. Now that's just like his impudence. Did he say that I was to give you anything? Cause I won't. He didn't, I said and dropped away, and watched the red lights die out in the dark. It was horribly cold because the wind was blowing off the sands. I climbed into my own train not an intermediate carriage this time and went to sleep. If the man with the beard had given me a rupee I should have kept it as a memento of a rather curious affair. But the consciousness of having done my duty was my only reward. Later on I reflected that two gentlemen like my friends could not do any good if they foregathered and personate correspondents of newspapers, and might if they stuck up one of the little rat-trap states of central India or southern Rajputana, 
get themselves into serious difficulties. I therefore took some trouble to describe them as accurately as I could remember to people who would be interested in deporting them, and succeeded, so I was later informed, in having them headed back from the Degumber borders. Then I became respectable, and returned to an office where there were no kings and no incidents except the daily manufacture of a newspaper. A newspaper office seems to attract every conceivable sort of person, to the prejudice of discipline. Zanonomission ladies arrive, and beg that the editor will instantly abandon all his duties to describe a Christian prize giving in a back slum of a perfectly inaccessible village. Colonels who have been overpassed for commands sit down and sketch the outline of a series of 10, 12, or 24 leading articles on seniority versus selection. Missionaries wish to know why they have not been permitted to escape from their regular vehicles of abuse and swear at a brother missionary under special patronage of the editorial we, stranded theatrical companies troop up to explain that they cannot pay for their advertisements, but on their return from New Zealand or Tahiti will do so with interest, inventors of patent punkapulling machines, carriage couplings and unbreakable swords and axle trees call with specifications in their pockets and hours at their disposal. T companies enter and elaborate their prospectuses with the office pens, secretaries of ball committees clamor to have the glories of their last dance more fully expounded, strange ladies rustle in and say I want a hundred ladies cards printed at once, please, which is manifestly part of an editor's duty, and every dissolute ruffian that ever tramped the Grand Trunk Road makes it his business to ask for employment as a proofreader. And, all the time, the telephone bell is ringing madly, and kings are being killed on the continent, and empires are saying, you're another, and Mr. Gladstone is calling down brimstone upon the British dominions, and the little black copy boys are whining, ka pi cha ha yet, copy wanted, like tired bees, and most of the paper is as blank as Madrid's shield. But that is the amusing part of the year. There are other six months wherein none ever come to call and the thermometer walks inch by inch up to the top of the glass, and the office is darkened to just above reading light, and the press machines are red hot of touch, and nobody writes anything but accounts of amusements in the hill stations or obituary notices. Then the telephone becomes a tinkling terror, because it tells you of the sudden deaths of men and women that you knew intimately, and the prickly heat covers you as with a garment, and you sit down and write a slight increase of sickness is reported from the Kudajanta Khan district. The outbreak is purely sporadic in its nature, and, thanks to the energetic efforts of the district authorities, is now almost at an end. It is, however, with deep regret we record the death, etc. Then the sickness really breaks out, and the less recording and reporting the better for the peace of the subscribers. But the empires and the kings continue to divert themselves as selfishly as before and the foreman thinks that a daily paper really ought to come out once in 24 hours, and all the people at the hill stations in the middle of their amusements say good gracious. Why can't the paper be sparkling? I'm sure there's plenty going on up here. That is the dark half of the moon, and, as the advertisements say, must be experienced to be appreciated. It was in that season, and a remarkably evil season, that the paper began running the last issue of the week on Saturday night which is to say Sunday morning, after the custom of a London paper. This was a great convenience, for immediately after the paper was put to bed, the dawn would lower the thermometer from 96 degrees to almost 84 degrees for almost half an hour, and in that chill you have no idea how cold is 84 degrees on the grass until you begin to pray for it a very tired man could set off to sleep ere the heat roused him. One Saturday night it was my pleasant duty to put the paper to bed alone. A king or courtier or a courtesan or a community was going to die or get a new constitution, or do something that was important on the other side of the world, and the paper was to be held open till the latest possible minute in order to catch the telegram. It was a pitchy black night, as stifling as a June night can be, and the loo, the red-hot wind from the westward, was booming among the tinder dry trees and pretending that the rain was on its heels. Now and again a spot of almost boiling water would fall on the dust with the flop of a frog, but all our weary world knew that was only pretense. It was a shade cooler in the press room than the office, so I sat there, while the type ticked and clicked, and the night jars hooted at the windows, and the all-but-naked compositors wiped the sweat from their foreheads and called for water. 
The thing that was keeping us back, whatever it was, would not come off, though the loo dropped and the last type was set, and the whole round earth stood still in the choking heat, with its finger on its lip, to wait the event. I drowsed, and wondered whether the telegraph was a blessing, and whether this dying man, or struggling people, was aware of the inconvenience the delay was causing. There was no special reason beyond the heat and worry to make tension, but, as the clock hands crept up to three o'clock and the machines spun their flywheels two and three times to see that all was in order, before I said the word that would set them off, I could have shrieked aloud. Then the roar and rattle of the wheels shivered the quiet into little bits. I rose to go away, but two men in white clothes stood in front of me. The first one said it's him. The second said so it is. And they both laughed almost as loudly as the machinery roared, and mopped their foreheads. We see there was a light burning across the road and we were sleeping in that ditch there for coolness, and I said to my friend here, the office is open. Let's come along and speak to him as turned us back from the degumber state, said the smaller of the two. He was the man I had met in the Mao train, and his fellow was the red-bearded man of Mare War Junction. There was no mistaking the eyebrows of the one or the beard of the other. I was not pleased, because I wished to go to sleep, not to squabble with loafers. What do you want? I asked. Half an hour's talk with you cool and comfortable, in the office, said the red-bearded man. We'd like some drink the contract doesn't begin yet, Peachy, so you needn't look but what we really want is advice. We don't want money. We ask you as a favor, because you did us a bad turn about D. Gumber. I led from the press room to the stifling office with the maps on the walls, and the red-haired man rubbed his hands. That's something like, said he. This was the proper shop to come to. Now, sir, let me introduce to you Brother Peachy Carnahan, that's him, and Brother Daniel Dravitt, that is me, and the less said about our professions the better for we have been most things in our time. Soldier, sailor, compositor, photographer, proofreader, street preacher, and correspondence of the backwoodsman when we thought the paper wanted one. Carnahan is sober, and so am I look at us first and see that's sure. It will save you cutting into my talk. We'll take one of your cigars apiece, and you shall see us light. I watched the test. The men were absolutely sober so I gave them each a tepid peg. Well and good, said Carnahan of the eyebrows, wiping the froth from his mustache. Let me talk now, Dan. We have been all over India, mostly on foot. We have been boiler fitters, engine drivers, petty contractors, and all that, and we have decided that India isn't big enough for such as us. They certainly were too big for the office. Dravit's beard seemed to fill half the room and Carnahan's shoulders the other half, as they sat on the big table. Carnahan continued, the country isn't half worked out because they that governs it won't let you touch it. They spend all their blessed time in governing it, and you can't lift a spade, nor chip a rock, nor look for oil, nor anything like that without all the government saying leave it alone and let us govern. Therefore, such as it is, we will let it alone and go away to some other place where a man isn't crowded and can come to his own. We are not little men, and there is nothing that we are afraid of except drink, and we have signed a contract on that. Therefore, we are going away to be kings. Kings in our own right, muttered Dravit. Yes, of course, I said. You've been tramping in the sun, and it's a very warm night, and hadn't you better sleep over the notion? Come tomorrow. Neither drunk nor sunstruck, said Dravit. We have slept over the notion half a year, and require to see books and atlases, and we have decided that there is only one place now in the world that two strong men can sar a whack. They call it Kafiristan. By my reckoning it's the top right-hand corner of Afghanistan, not more than three hundred miles from Peshawar. They have two and thirty heathen idols there, and will be the thirty-third. It's a mountainous country, and the women of those parts are very beautiful. But that is provided against in the Kant rack, said Carnahan. Neither women nor liquor, Daniel. And that's all we know, except that no one has gone there, and they fight, 
and in any place where they fight a man who knows how to drill men can always be a king. We shall go to those parts and say to any king we find do you want to vanquish your foes, and we will show him how to drill men, for that we know better than anything else. Then we will subvert that king and seize his throne and establish a dynasty. You will be cut to pieces before you are fifty miles across the border, I said. You have to travel through Afghanistan to get to that country. It's one mass of mountains and peaks and glaciers, and no Englishman has been through it. The people are utter brutes, and even if you reached them you couldn't do anything. That's more like, said Carnahan. If you could think us a little more mad we would be more pleased. We have come to you to know about this country, to read a book about it, and to be shown maps. We want you to tell us that we are fools and to show us your books. He turned to the bookcases. Are you at all in earnest? I said. A little, said Dravet, sweetly. As big a map as you have got, even if it's all blank where Kaffir Ristan is, and any books you've got. We can read, though we aren't very educated. I uncussed the big 32 miles to the inch map of India, and two smaller frontier maps, hauled down volume INF gone of the Encyclopedia Britannica, and the men consulted them. See here, said Dravet, his thumb on the map. Up to Jagdalak, Peachy and me know the road. We was there with Roberts's army. We'll have to turn off to the right at Jagdalak through Lakaman territory. Then we get among the hills 14,000 feet 15,000 it will be cold work there, but it don't look very far on the map. I handed him wood on the sources of the Oxus. Carnahan was deep in the encyclopedia. They're a mixed lot, said Dravet, reflectively, and it won't help us to know the names of their tribes. The more tribes the more they'll fight, and the better for us. From Jagdalak to Ashang. HMM. But all the information about the country is as sketchy and inaccurate as can be, I protested. No one knows anything about it really. Here's the file of the United Services Institute. Read what Bellew says. Blow Bellew, said Carnahan. Dan, they're an all-fired lot of heathens, but this book here says they think they're related to us English. I smoked while the men poured over Raverty, Wood, the maps and the encyclopedia. There is no use your waiting, said Dravet, politely. It's about four o'clock now. We'll go before six o'clock if you want to sleep, and we won't steal any of the papers. Don't you sit up. We're two harmless lunatics, and if you come, tomorrow evening, down to the Sarai we'll say goodbye to you. You are two fools, I answered. You'll be turned back at the frontier or cut up the minute you set foot in Afghanistan. Do you want any money or a recommendation down country? I can help you to the chance of work next week. Next week we shall be hard at work ourselves, thank you, said Dravet. It isn't so easy being a king as it looks. When we've got our kingdom in going order we'll let you know, and you can come up and help us to govern it. Would two lunatics make a contract like that, said Carnahan, with subdued pride showing me a greasy half-sheet of notepaper on which was written the following. I copied it, then and there, as a curiosity. This contract between me and you pursuing witnesseth in the name of God Amen and so forth. 1. That me and you will settle this matter together, i.e., to be kings of Kafir Ristan. 2. That you and me will not while this matter is being settled, look at any liquor, nor any woman black, white, or brown so as to get mixed up with one or the other harmful. 3. That we conduct ourselves with dignity and discretion, and if one of us gets into trouble the other will stay by him. Signed by you and me this day. Peachy Talia Faro Carnahan. Daniel Dravet. Both gentlemen at large. There was no need for the last article, said Carnahan, blushing modestly, but it looks regular. Now you know the sort of men that loafers are we are loafers, Dan, until we get out of India and do you think that we could sign a contract like that unless we was in earnest? We have kept away from the two things that make life worth having. You won't enjoy your lives much longer if you are going to try this idiotic adventure. Don't set the office on fire, I said, and go away before nine o'clock. 
I left them still poring over the maps and making notes on the back of the Kant rack. Be sure to come down to the Sarai tomorrow, were their parting words. The Kumharsan Sarai is the great four-square sink of humanity where the strings of camels and horses from the north load and unload. All the nationalities of Central Asia may be found there, and most of the folk of India proper. Balk and Bokhara there meet Bengal and Bombay, and try to draw eye teeth. You can buy ponies, turquoises, Persian pussy cats, saddlebags, fat-tailed sheep and musk in the Kumharsan Sarai, and get many strange things for nothing. In the afternoon I went down there to see whether my friends intended to keep their word or were lying about drunk. A priest attired in fragments of ribbons and rags stalked up to me, gravely twisting a child's paper whirligig. Behind him was his servant, bending under the load of a crate of mud toys. The two were loading up two camels, and the inhabitants of the Sarai watched them with shrieks of laughter. The priest is mad, said a horse dealer to me. He is going up to Kabul to sell toys to the Amir. He will either be raised to honor or have his head cut off. He came in here this morning and has been behaving madly ever since. The witless are under the protection of God, stammered a flat-cheeked Uzbeg in broken Hindi. They foretell future events. Would they could have foretold that my caravan would have been cut up by the Shinewaris almost within shadow of the pass, grunted the Yusufte agent of a Rajputana trading house whose goods had been feloniously diverted into the hands of other robbers just across the border, and whose misfortunes were the laughing stock of the bazaar. Oh hey, priest, whence come you and whither do you go? From room have I come, shouted the priest, waving his whirligig, from room, blown by the breath of a hundred devils across the sea. Oh thieves, robbers, liars, the blessing of Perkhan on pigs, dogs and perjurers. Who will take the protected of God to the north to sell charms that are never still to the Amir? The camels shall not gall, the sons shall not fall sick and the wives shall remain faithful while they are away, of the men who give me place in their caravan. Who will assist me to slipper the king of the Rus with a golden slipper with a silver heel? The protection of Perkhan be upon his labors. He spread out the skirts of his gabardine and pirouette between the lines of tethered horses. There starts a caravan from Peshawar to Kabul in twenty days, Huzrat, said the Yusufte trader. My camels go therewith. Do thou also go and bring us good luck. I will go even now, shouted the priest. I will depart upon my winged camels, and be at Peshawar in a day. Ho! Oh. Has Armir Khan, he yelled to his servant drive out the camels, but let me first mount my own. He leaped on the back of his beast as it knelt, and turning round to me, cried. Come thou also, Saib, a little along the road and I will sell thee a charm and amulet that shall make thee king of Kafir Ristan. Then the light broke upon me, and I followed the two camels out of the Sarai till we reached open road and the priest halted. What do you think o oh, that, said he in English. Karnahan can't talk their patter, so I've made him my servant. He makes a handsome servant. Tisn't he for nothing that I've been knocking about the country for fourteen years. Didn't I do that talk neat? We'll hitch on to a caravan at Peshawar till we get to Jagdalak, and then we'll see if we can get donkeys for our camels, and strike into Kafir Ristan. Whirligigs for the Amir, Alor. Put your hand under the camel bags and tell me what you feel. I felt the butt of a martini, and another and another. Twenty of em, said Dravet, placidly. Twenty of em, and ammunition to correspond, under the whirligigs and the mud dolls. Heaven help you if you are caught with those things. I said. A martini is worth her weight in silver among the Patans. Fifteen hundred rupees of capital every rupee we could beg, borrow or steal are invested on these two camels, said Dravet. We won't get caught. We're going through the caber with a regular caravan. Who touch a poor mad priest? Have you got everything you want? I asked, overcome with astonishment. Not yet, but we shall soon. Give us a memento of your kindness, brother. You did me a service yesterday, and that time in Mare War. Half my kingdom shall you have, as the saying is. 
I slipped a small charm compass from my watch chain and handed it up to the priest. Goodbye, said Dravet, giving me his hand cautiously. It's the last time we'll shake hands with an Englishman these many days. Shake hands with him, Carnahan, he cried, as the second camel passed me. Carnahan leaned down and shook hands. Then the camels passed away along the dusty road, and I was left alone to wonder. My eye could detect no failure in the disguises. The scene in the sarai attested that they were complete to the native mind. There was just the chance, therefore, that Carnahan and Dravet would be able to wander through Afghanistan without detection. But, beyond, they would find death, certain and awful death. Ten days later a native friend of mine, giving me the news of the day from Peshawar, wound up his letter with there has been much laughter here on account of a certain mad priest who is going in his estimation to sell petty gods and insignificant trinkets which he ascribes as great charms to H.H. the Amir of Bokhara. He passed through Peshawar and associated himself to the second summer caravan that goes to Kabul. The merchants are pleased because through superstition they imagine that such mad fellows bring good fortune. The two then, were beyond the border. I would have prayed for them, but, that night, a real king died in Europe, and demanded an obituary notice. The wheel of the world swings through the same phases again and again. Summer passed and winter thereafter, and came and passed again. The daily paper continued and I with it, and upon the third summer there fell a hot night, a night issue, and a strained waiting for something to be telegraphed from the other side of the world, exactly as had happened before. A few great men had died in the past two years, the machines worked with more clatter, and some of the trees in the office garden were a few feet taller. But that was all the difference. I passed over to the press room, and went through just such a scene as I have already described. The nervous tension was stronger than it had been two years before, and I felt the heat more acutely. At three o'clock I cried, print off, and turned to go, when there crept to my chair what was left of a man. He was bent into a circle, his head was sunk between his shoulders, and he moved his feet one over the other like a bear. I could hardly see whether he walked or crawled this rag-wrapped, whining cripple who addressed me by name, crying that he was come back. Can you give me a drink, he whimpered. For the Lord's sake, give me a drink. I went back to the office, the man following with groans of pain, and I turned up the lamp. Don't you know me? he gasped, dropping into a chair, and he turned his drawn face, surmounted by a shock of grey hair, to the light. I looked at him intently. Once before had I seen eyebrows that met over the nose in an inch broad black band, but for the life of me I could not tell where. I don't know you, I said, handing him the whiskey. What can I do for you? He took a gulp of the spirit raw, and shivered in spite of the suffocating heat. I've come back, he repeated, and I was the king of Kafir Rist and me and Dravet crowned kings we was. In this office we settled it you sitting there and giving us the books. I am Peachy Peachy Talia Pharaoh Carnahan, and you've been sitting here ever since so lord. I was more than a little astonished, and expressed my feelings accordingly. It's true, said Carnahan, with a dry cackle, nursing his feet which were wrapped in rags. True as gospel. Kings we were, with crowns upon our heads me and Dravet poor Dan oh, poor, poor Dan, that would never take advice, not though I begged of him. Take the whiskey, I said, and take your own time. Tell me all you can recollect of everything from beginning to end. You got across the border on your camels, Dravet dressed as a mad priest and you his servant. Do you remember that? I ain't mad yet, but I will be that way soon. Of course I remember. Keep looking at me, or maybe my words will go all to pieces. Keep looking at me in my eyes and don't say anything. I leaned forward and looked into his face as steadily as I could. He dropped one hand upon the table and I grasped it by the wrist. It was twisted like a bird's claw, and upon the back was a ragged, red, diamond-shaped scar. No, don't look there. Look at me, said Carnahan. That comes afterwards, but for the Lord's sake don't dis me. We left with that caravan, me and Dravet, 
playing all sorts of antics to amuse the people we were with. Dravet used to make us laugh in the evenings when all the people was cooking their dinners cooking their dinners, and, what did they do then? They lit little fires with sparks that went into Dravet's beard, and we all laughed fit to die. Little red fires they was, going into Dravet's big red beard so funny. His eyes left mine and he smiled foolishly. You went as far as Jagdalik with that caravan, I said at a venture, after you had lit those fires. To Jagdalik, where you turned off to try to get into Kafiristan. No, we didn't neither. What are you talking about? We turned off before Jagdalik, because we heard the roads was good. But they wasn't good enough for our two camels mine and Dravitz. When we left the caravan, Dravit took off all his clothes and mine too, and said we would be heathen, because the Kafirs didn't allow Mohammedans to talk to them. So we dressed betwixt and between, and such a sight as Daniel Dravit I never saw yet nor expect to see again. He burned half his beard, and slung a sheepskin over his shoulder, and shaved his head into patterns. He shaved mine, too, and made me wear outrageous things to look like a heathen. That was in a most mountainous country, and our camels couldn't go along any more because of the mountains. They were tall and black, and coming home I saw them fight like wild goats there are lots of goats in Kafiristan. And these mountains, they never keep still, no more than the goats. Always fighting they are, and don't let you sleep at night. Take some more whiskey, I said, very slowly. What did you and Daniel Dravit do when the camels could go no further because of the rough roads that led into Kafiristan? What did which do? There was a party called Peachy Talia Faro Karnahan that was with Dravit. Shall I tell you about him? He died out there in the cold. Slap from the bridge fell old Peachy turning and twisting in the air like a penny whirligig that you can sell to the Amir no, they was two for three ha pence, those whirligigs, or I am much mistaken and woeful sore. And then these camels were no use, and Peachy said to Dravit for the Lord's sake, let's get out of this before our heads are chopped off, and with that they killed the camels all among the mountains, not having anything in particular to eat, but first they took off the boxes with the guns and the ammunition, till two men came along driving four mules. Dravit up and dances in front of them, singing, Sell me four mules. Says the first man, If you are rich enough to buy, you are rich enough to rob, but before ever he could put his hand to his knife, Dravit breaks his neck over his knee, and the other party runs away. So Karnahan loaded the mules with the rifles that was taken off the camels, and together we starts forward into those bitter cold mountainous parts, and never a road broader than the back of your hand. He paused for a moment, while I asked him if he could remember the nature of the country through which he had journeyed. I am telling you as straight as I can, but my head isn't as good as it might be. They drove nails through it to make me hear better how Dravit died. The country was mountainous and the mules were most contrary, and the inhabitants was dispersed and solitary. They went up and up, and down and down, and that other party Carnahan, was imploring of Dravit not to sing and whistle so loud, for fear of bringing down the tremendous avalanches. But Dravit says that if a king couldn't sing it wasn't worth being king, and whacked the mules over the rump, and never took no heed for ten cold days. We came to a big level valley all among the mountains, and the mules were near dead, so we killed them, not having anything in special for them or us to eat. We sat upon the boxes, and played odd and even with the cartridges that was jolted out. Then ten men with bows and arrows ran down that valley, chasing twenty men with bows and arrows, and the row was tremendous. They was fair men fairer than you or me with yellow hair and remarkable well built. Says Dravit, unpacking the guns this is the beginning of the business. We'll fight for the ten men, and with that he fires two rifles at the twenty men and drops one of them at two hundred yards from the rock where we was sitting. The other men began to run, but Carnahan and Dravit sits on the boxes picking them off at all ranges, up and down the valley. Then we goes up to the ten men that had run across the snow too, and they fires a footy little arrow at us. Dravit he shoots above their heads and they all falls down flat. Then he walks over them and kicks them, and then he lifts them up and shakes hands all around to make them friendly like. 
He calls them and gives them the boxes to carry, and waves his hand for all the world as though he was king already. They takes the boxes and him across the valley and up the hill into a pine wood on the top, where there was half a dozen big stone idols. Dravid he goes to the biggest a fellow they call Imbra and lays a rifle and a cartridge at his feet, rubbing his nose respectful with his own nose, patting him on the head, and saluting in front of it. He turns round to the men and nods his head, and says, that's all right. I'm in the know too, and these old Jim Jams are my friends. Then he opens his mouth and points down it, and when the first man brings him food, he says no, and when the second man brings him food, he says no, but when one of the old priests and the boss of the village brings him food, he says yes, very haughty, and eats it slow. That was how we came to our first village, without any trouble, just as though we had tumbled from the skies. But we tumbled from one of those damned rope bridges, you see, and you couldn't expect a man to laugh much after that. Take some more whiskey and go on, I said. That was the first village you came into. How did you get to be king? I wasn't king, said Carnahan. Dravid he was the king, and a handsome man he looked with the gold crown on his head and all. Him and the other party stayed in that village, and every morning Dravid sat by the side of old Imbra, and the people came and worshipped. That was Dravid's order. Then a lot of men came into the valley, and Carnahan and Dravid picks them off with the rifles before they knew where they was and runs down into the valley and up again the other side, and finds another village, same as the first one, and the people all falls down flat on their faces, and Dravit says, now what is the trouble between you two villages, and the people points to a woman, as fair as you or me, that was carried off, and Dravit takes her back to the first village and counts up. The dead eight there was. For each dead man Dravit pours a little milk on the ground and waves his arms like a whirligig and, that's all right, says he. Then he and Carnahan takes the big boss of each village by the arm and walks them down into the valley, and shows them how to scratch a line with a spear right down the valley, and gives each a sod of turf from both sides o' the line. Then all the people comes down and shouts like the devil and all, and Dravit says, go and dig the land, and be fruitful and multiply, which they did, though they didn't understand. Then we asks the names of things in their lingo bread and water and fire and idols and such, and Dravit leads the priest of each village up to the idol, and says he must sit there and judge the people, and if anything goes wrong he is to be shot. Next week they was all turning up the land in the valley as quiet as bees and much prettier, and the priests heard all the complaints and told Dravit in dumb show what it was about. That's just the beginning, says Dravit. They think we're gods. He and Carnahan picks out twenty good men and shows them how to click off a rifle, and form fours, and advance in line, and they was very pleased to do so, and clever to see the hang of it. Then he takes out his pipe and his backy pouch and leaves one at one village, and one at the other, and off we two goes to see what was to be done in the next valley. That was all rock, and there was a little village there, and Carnahan says, send em to the old valley to plant and takes M there and gives M some land that wasn't took before. They were a poor lot, and we blooded M with a kid before letting M into the new kingdom. That was to impress the people, and then they settled down quiet, and Carnahan went back to Dravid who had got into another valley, all snow and ice and most mountainous. There was no people there and the army got afraid, so Dravid shoots one of them, and goes on till he finds some people in a village and the army explains that unless the people wants to be killed they had better not shoot their little matchlocks, for they had matchlocks. We makes friends with the priest and I stays there alone with two of the army, teaching the men how to drill, and a thundering big chief comes across the snow with kettle drums and horns twanging, because he heard there was a new god kicking about. Carnahan sights for the brown of the men half a mile across the snow and wings one of them. Then he sends a message to the chief that, unless he wished to be killed, he must come and shake hands with me and leave his arms behind. The chief comes alone first, and Carnahan shakes hands with him and whirls his arms about, same as Dravit used, and very much surprised that chief was, and strokes my eyebrows. Then Carnahan goes alone to the chief, and asks him in dumb show if he had an enemy he hated. I have, says the chief. 
So Karnahan weeds out the pick of his men, and sets the two of the army to show them drill and at the end of two weeks the men can maneuver about as well as volunteers. So he marches with the chief to a great big plain on the top of a mountain, and the chief's men rushes into a village and takes it, we three martinis firing into the brown of the enemy. So we took that village too, and I gives the chief a rag from my coat and says, Occupy till I come, which was scriptural. By way of a reminder, when me and the army was 1800 yards away, I drops a bullet near him standing on the snow, and all the people falls flat on their faces. Then I sends a letter to Dravit, wherever he be by land or by sea. At the risk of throwing the creature out of train I interrupted, how could you write a letter up yonder? The letter? Oh. The letter. Keep looking at me between the eyes, please. It was a string talk letter, that we'd learned the way of it from a blind beggar in the Punjab. I remember that there had once come to the office a blind man with a knotted twig and a piece of string which he wound round the twig according to some cipher of his own. He could, after the lapse of days or hours, repeat the sentence which he had reeled up. He had reduced the alphabet to eleven primitive sounds, and tried to teach me his method, but failed. I sent that letter to Dravit, said Carnahan, and told him to come back because this kingdom was growing too big for me to handle, and then I struck for the first valley, to see how the priests were working. They called the village we took along with the chief, Bashkai, and the first village we took, E.R. Hebrew. The priest at E.R. Hebrew was doing all right, but they had a lot of pending cases about land to show me, and some men from another village had been firing arrows at night. I went out and looked for that village and fired four rounds at it from a thousand yards. That used all the cartridges I cared to spend, and I waited for Dravit, who had been away two or three months, and I kept my people quiet. One morning I heard the devil's own noise of drums and horns, and Dan Dravit marches down the hill with his army and a tail of hundreds of men, and, which was the most amazing a great gold crown on his head. My gourd, Carnahan, says Daniel, this is a tremendous business, and we've got the whole country as far as it's worth having. I am the son of Alexander by Queen Semiramis, and you're my younger brother and a god too. It's the biggest thing we've ever seen. I've been marching and fighting for six weeks with the army, and every footy little village for fifty miles has come in rejoiceful, and more than that, I've got the key of the whole show, as you'll see, and I've got a crown for you. I told M to make two of M at a place called Shu, where the gold lies in the rock like suet in mutton. Gold I've seen, and turquoise I've kicked out of the cliffs, and there's garnets in the sands of the river, and here's a chunk of amber that a man brought me. Call up all the priests and, here, take your crown. One of the men opens a black hair bag and I slips the crown on. It was too small and too heavy, but I wore it for the glory. Hammered gold it was five pound weight, like a hoop of a barrel. Peachy, says Dravit, we don't want to fight no more. The craft's the trick so help me, and he brings forward that same chief that I left at Bashkai Billy Fish we called him afterwards, because he was so like Billy Fish that drove the big tank engine at Mach on the Bolin in the old days. Shake hands with him, says Dravit, and I shook hands and nearly dropped, for Billy Fish gave me the grip. I said nothing, but tried him with the fellow craft grip. He answers, all right, and I tried the master's grip, but that was a slip. A fellow craft he is. I says to Dan. Does he know the word? He does, says Dan, and all the priests know. It's a miracle. The chiefs and the priest can work a fellow craft lodge in a way that's very like ours, and they've cut the marks on the rocks but they don't know the third degree, and they've come to find out. It's Gord's truth. I've known these long years that the Afghans knew up to the fellow craft degree, but this is a miracle. A god and a grand master of the craft am I, and a lodge in the third degree I will open, and will raise the head priests and the chiefs of the villages. It's against all the law, I says, holding a lodge without warrant from anyone, and we never held office in any lodge. It's a master stroke of policy, says Dravit. It means running the country as easy as a four-wheeled bogey on a downgrade. We can't stop to inquire now, or they'll turn against us. 
I've forty chiefs at my heel, and passed and raised according to their merit they shall be. Billet these men on the villages and see that we run up a lodge of some kind. The temple of Imbra will do for the lodge room. The women must make aprons as you show them. I'll hold a levy of chiefs tonight and lodge tomorrow. I was fair rim off my legs, but I wasn't such a fool as not to see what a pull this craft business gave us. I showed the priests' families how to make aprons of the degrees, but for Dravit's apron the blue border and marks was made of turquoise lumps on white hide, not cloth. We took a great square stone in the temple for the master's chair, and little stones for the officers' chairs, and painted the black pavement with white squares, and did what we could to make things regular. At the levee which was held that night on the hillside with big bonfires, Dravit gives out that him and me were gods and sons of Alexander, and past grand masters in the craft, and was come to make Kafir in a country where every man should eat in peace and drink in quiet, and specially obey us. Then the chiefs come round to shake hands, and they was so hairy and white and fair it was just shaking hands with old friends. We gave them names according as they was like men we had known in India Billy Fish, Holly Dilworth, Picky Kurgan that was Bazaar Master when I was at Mao, and so on, and so on. The most amazing miracle was at Lodge next night. One of the old priests was watching us continuous, and I felt uneasy, for I knew we'd have to fudge the ritual, and I didn't know what the men knew. The old priest was a stranger come in from beyond the village of Bashkai. The minute Dravid puts on the master's apron that the girls had made for him, the priest fetches a hoop and a howl, and tries to overturn the stone that Dravid was sitting on. It's all up now, I says. That comes of meddling with the craft without warrant. Dravit never winked an eye, not when ten priests took and tilted over the Grand Master's chair which was to say the stone of Imbra. The priest begins rubbing the bottom end of it to clear away the black dirt, and presently he shows all the other priests the Master's mark, same as was on Dravit's apron, cut into the stone. Not even the priests of the Temple of Imbra knew it was there. The old chap falls flat on his face at Dravit's feet and kisses him. Luck again, says Dravit, across the lodge to me, they say it's the missing mark that no one could understand the why of. We're more than safe now. Then he bangs the butt of his gun for a gavel and says by virtue of the authority vested in me by my own right hand and the help of Peachy, I declare myself Grand Master of all Freemasonry in Kaffir Ristin in this the mother lodge o' the country and king of Kaffir Ristin equally with Peachy. At that he puts on his crown and I puts on mine I was doing senior warden and we opens the lodge in most ample form. It was a amazing miracle. The priests moved in lodge through the first two degrees almost without telling, as if the memory was coming back to them. After that, Peachy and Dravit raised such as was worthy high priests and chiefs of far-off villages. Billy Fish was the first and I can tell you we scared the soul out of him. It was not in any way according to ritual, but it served our turn. We didn't raise more than ten of the biggest men because we didn't want to make the degree common. And they was clamoring to be raised. In another six months, says Dravit, we'll hold another communication and see how you are working. Then he asks them about their villages, and learns that they was fighting one against the other and were fair sick and tired of it and when they wasn't doing that they was fighting with the Mohammedans. You can fight those when they come into our country, says Dravit. Tell off every tenth man of your tribes for a frontier guard, and send two hundred at a time to this valley to be drilled. Nobody is going to be shot or speared any more so long as he does well, and I know that you won't cheat me because you are white people sons of Alexander and not like common, black Mohammedans. You are my people and by God, says he running off into English at the end I'll make a damned fine nation of you, or I'll die in the making. I can't tell all we did for the next six months because Dravit did a lot I couldn't see the hang of, and he learned their lingo in a way I never could. My work was to help the people plow, and now and again to go out with some of the army and see what the other villages were doing, and make them throw rope bridges across the ravines which cut up the country horrid. Dravit was very kind to me, but when he walked up and down in the pine wood pulling that bloody red beard of his with both fists I knew he was thinking plans I could not advise him about, and I just waited for orders. But Dravit never showed me disrespect before the people. 
They were afraid of me and the army, but they loved Dan. He was the best of friends with the priests and the chiefs, but anyone could come across the hills with a complaint and Dravit would hear him out fair, and call four priests together and say what was to be done. He used to call in Billy Fish from Bashkai, and Picky Kurgan from Shu, and an old chief we called Kafuslam it was like enough to his real name and hold councils with M when there was any fighting to be done in small villages. That was his council of war, and the four priests of Bashkai, Shu, Kawak, and Medora was his privy council. Between the lot of M they sent me, with forty men and twenty rifles, and sixty men carrying turquoises, into the Gorband country to buy those handmade martini rifles, that come out of the emir's workshops at Kabul, from one of the emir's Haredi regiments that would have sold the very teeth out of their mouths for turquoises. I stayed in Gorband a month, and gave the governor the pick of my baskets for hush money, and bribed the colonel of the regiment some more, and, between the two and the tribe's people, we got more than a hundred handmade martinis, a hundred good Kohat Jaziles that'll throw to six hundred yards, and forty men loads of very bad ammunition for the rifles. I came back with what I had, and distributed M among the men that the chiefs sent in to me to drill. Dravit was too busy to attend to those things, but the old army that we first made helped me, and we turned out five hundred men that could drill, and two hundred that knew how to hold arms pretty straight. Even those corkscrewed, handmade guns was a miracle to them. Dravit talked big about powder shops and factories, walking up and down in the pine wood when the winter was coming on. I won't make a nation, says he. I'll make an empire. These men aren't niggers, they're English. Look at their eyes look at their mouths. Look at the way they stand up. They sit on chairs in their own houses. They're the lost tribes, or something like it, and they've grown to be English. I'll take a census in the spring if the priests don't get frightened. There must be a fair two million of em in these hills. The villages are full of little children. Two million people two hundred and fifty thousand fighting men and all English. They only want the rifles and a little drilling. Two hundred and fifty thousand men, ready to cut in on Russia's right flank when she tries for India. Peachy, man, he says, chewing his beard in great hunks, we shall be emperors emperors of the earth. Raja Brook will be a suckling to us. I'll treat with the Viceroy on equal terms. I'll ask him to send me twelve picked English twelve that I know of to help us govern a bit. There's Macrae, Sergeant Pensioner at Seagauli many's the good dinner he's given me, and his wife a pair of trousers. There's Duncan, the warder of Townhu Jail, there's hundreds that I could lay my hand on if I was in India. The Viceroy shall do it for me. I'll send a man through in the spring for those men, and I'll write for a dispensation from the Grand Lodge for what I've done as Grand Master. That and all the Snyders that'll be thrown out when the native troops in India take up the Martini. They'll be worn smooth, but they'll do for fighting in these hills. Twelve English, a hundred thousand Snyders run through the Amir's country in driblets I'd be content with twenty thousand in one year and we'd be an empire. When everything was shipshape, I'd hand over the crown this crown I'm wearing now to Queen Victoria on my knees, and she'd say rise up, Sir Daniel Dravit. Oh, it's big. It's big, I tell you. But there's so much to be done in every place Bashkai, Kawak, Shu, and everywhere else. What is it? I says. There are no more men coming in to be drilled this autumn. Look at those fat, black clouds. They're bringing the snow. It isn't that, says Daniel, putting his hand very hard on my shoulder, and I don't wish to say anything that's against you, for no other living man would have followed me and made me what I am as you have done. You're a first-class commander-in-chief, and the people know you, but it's a big country, and somehow you can't help me, Peachy, in the way I want to be helped. Go to your blasted priests, then. I said, and I was sorry when I made that remark but it did hurt me sore to find Daniel talking so superior when I'd drilled all the men, and done all he told me. Don't let's quarrel, Peachy, says Daniel without cursing. You're a king too, and the half of this kingdom is yours, but can't you see, Peachy, we want cleverer men than us now three or four of em that we can scatter about for our deputies. 
It's a hugest great state, and I can't always tell the right thing to do, and I haven't time for all I want to do, and here's the winter coming on and all. He put half his beard into his mouth, and it was as red as the gold of his crown. I'm sorry, Daniel, says I I've done all I could. I've drilled the men and shown the people how to stack their oats better, and I've brought in those tinware rifles from Gorband but I know what you're driving at. I take it kings always feel oppressed that way. There's another thing too, says Dravet, walking up and down. The winter's coming and these people won't be giving much trouble, and if they do we can't move about. I want a wife. For God's sake leave the women alone. I says. We've both got all the work we can, though I am a fool. Remember the cont rack, and keep clear o' women. The cont rack only lasted till such time as we was kings, and kings we have been these months past, says Dravet, weighing his crown in his hand. You go get a wife too, peachy and nice, strappin', plump girl that'll keep you warm in the winter. They're prettier than English girls, and we can take the pick of em. Boil em once or twice in hot water, and they'll come as fair as chicken and ham. Don't tempt me. I says. I will not have any dealings with a woman not till we are a damn side more settled than we are now. I've been doing the work o' two men, and you've been doing the work o' three. Let's lie off a bit, and see if we can get some better tobacco from Afghan country and run in some good liquor, but no women. Who's talking o' women, says Dravet. I said wife a queen to breed a king's son for the king. A queen out of the strongest tribe, that'll make them your blood brothers, and that'll lie by your side and tell you all the people thinks about you and their own affairs. That's what I want. Do you remember that Bengali woman I kept at Mogul Sarai when I was plate layer, says I a fat lot oh good she was to me. She taught me the lingo and one or two other things, but what happened? She ran away with the station master's servant and half my month's pay. Then she turned up at Dajer Junction in tow of a half-caste, and had the MP Denke to say I was her husband all among the drivers of the running shed. We've done with that, says Dravet. These women are whiter than you or me, and a queen I will have for the winter months. For the last time o' oh, asking, Dan, do not, I says. It'll only bring us harm. The Bible says that kings ain't to waste their strength on women, especially when they've got a new raw kingdom to work over. For the last time of answering, I will, said Dravet, and he went away through the pine trees looking like a big red devil. The low sun hit his crown and beard on one side, and the two blazed like hot coals. But getting a wife was not as easy as Dan thought. He put it before the council, and there was no answer till Billy Fish said that he'd better ask the girls. Dravet damned them all round. What's wrong with me, he shouts, standing by the idle Imbra. Am I a dog or am I not enough of a man for your wenches? Haven't I put the shadow of my hand over this country? Who stopped the last Afghan raid? It was me really, but Dravet was too angry to remember. Who bought your guns? Who repaired the bridges? Who's the grand master of the sign cut in the stone, and he thumped his hand on the block that he used to sit on in Lodge, and at council, which opened like Lodge always. Billy Fish said nothing and no more did the others. Keep your hair on, Dan, said I, and asked the girls. That's how it's done at home, and these people are quite English. The marriage of a king is a matter of state, says Dan, in a white-hot rage, for he could feel, I hope, that he was going against his better mind. He walked out of the council room, and the others sat still, looking at the ground. Billy Fish, says I to the chief of Bashkai, what's the difficulty here? A straight answer to a true friend. You know says Billy Fish. How should a man tell you who know everything? How can daughters of men marry gods or devils? It's not proper. I remembered something like that in the Bible, but if, after seeing us as long as they had, they still believed we were gods it wasn't for me to undeceive them. A god can do anything, says I if the king is fond of a girl he'll not let her die. She'll have to, said Billy Fish. There are all sorts of gods and devils in these mountains, 
and now and again a girl marries one of them and isn't seen anymore. Besides, you two know the mark cut in the stone. Only the gods know that. We thought you were men till you showed the sign of the master. I wished then that we had explained about the loss of the genuine secrets of a master mason at the first go-off, but I said nothing. All that night there was a blowing of horns in a little dark temple halfway down the hill, and I heard a girl crying fit to die. One of the priests told us that she was being prepared to marry the king. I'll have no nonsense of that kind, says Dan. I don't want to interfere with your customs, but I'll take my own wife. The girl's a little bit afraid, says the priest. She thinks she's going to die, and they are a hardening of her up down in the temple. Harden her very tender, then, says Dravet, or I'll harden you with the butt of a gun so that you'll never want to be hardened again. He licked his lips, did Dan, and stayed up walking about more than half the night, thinking of the wife that he was going to get in the morning. I wasn't any means comfortable, for I knew that dealings with a woman in foreign parts, though you was a crowned king twenty times over, could not but be risky. I got up very early in the morning while Dravet was asleep and I saw the priests talking together in whispers, and the chiefs talking together too, and they looked at me out of the corners of their eyes. What is up, fish? I says to the Bashkai man, who was wrapped up in his furs and looking splendid to behold. I can't rightly say, says he, but if you can induce the king to drop all this nonsense about marriage, you'll be doing him and me and yourself a great service. That I do believe, says I but sure, you know. Billy, as well as me, having fought against and for us, that the king and me are nothing more than two of the finest men that God Almighty ever made. Nothing more, I do assure you. That may be, says Billy Fish, and yet I should be sorry if it was. He sinks his head upon his great fur cloak for a minute and thinks. King, says he, be you man or God or devil, I'll stick by you today. I have twenty of my men with me and they will follow me. We'll go to Bashkai until the storm blows over. A little snow had fallen in the night, and everything was white except the greasy fat clouds that blew down and down from the north. Dravet came out with his crown on his head, swinging his arms and stamping his feet, and looking more pleased than Punch. For the last time, drop it, Dan, says I in a whisper. Billy Fish here says that there will be a row. A row among my people, says Dravet. Not much. Peachy, you're a fool not to get a wife too. Where's the girl, says he with a voice as loud as the braying of a jackass. Call up all the chiefs and priests, and let the emperor see if his wife suits him. There was no need to call anyone. They were all there leaning on their guns and spears round the clearing in the center of the pine wood. A deputation of priests went down to the little temple to bring up the girl and the horns blew up fit to wake the dead. Billy Fish saunters round and gets as close to Daniel as he could, and behind him stood his twenty men with matchlocks. Not a man of them under six feet. I was next to Dravet, and behind me was twenty men of the regular army. Up comes the girl, and a strapping wench she was, covered with silver and turquoises but white as death, and looking back every minute at the priests. She'll do, said Dan looking her over. What's to be afraid of, lass? Come and kiss me. He puts his arm round her. She shuts her eyes, gives a bit of a squeak, and down goes her face in the side of Dan's flaming red beard. The slut's bitten me, says he, clapping his hand to his neck, and, sure enough, his hand was red with blood. Billy Fish and two of his matchlock men catches hold of Dan by the shoulders and drags him into the Bashkai lot, while the priests howls in their lingo, neither God nor devil but a man. I was all taken aback, for a priest cut at me in front, and the army behind began firing into the Bashkai men. God a mighty, says Dan. What is the meaning o' this? Come back. Come away, says Billy Fish. Ruin and mutiny is the matter. We'll break for Bashkai if we can. I tried to give some sort of orders to my men the men o' the regular army but it was no use, so I fired into the brown of M with an English martini and drilled three beggars in a line. 
The valley was full of shouting, howling creatures, and every soul was shrieking, not a god nor a devil but only a man. The Bashkai troops stuck to Billy Fish all they were worth, but their matchlocks wasn't half as good as the Kabul breech loaders, and four of them dropped. Dan was bellowing like a bull, for he was very wrathy, and Billy Fish had a hard job to prevent him running out at the crowd. We can't stand, says Billy Fish. Make a run for it down the valley. The whole place is against us. The matchlock men ran, and we went down the valley in spite of Dravit's protestations. He was swearing horribly and crying out that he was a king. The priests rolled great stones on us, and the regular army fired hard, and there wasn't more than six men, not counting Dan, Billy Fish, and me, that came down to the bottom of the valley alive. Then they stopped firing and the horns in the temple blew again. Come away for God's sake come away, says Billy Fish. They'll send runners out to all the villages before ever we get to Bashkai. I can protect you there, but I can't do anything now. My own notion is that Dan began to go mad in his head from that hour. He stared up and down like a stuck pig. Then he was all for walking back alone and killing the priests with his bare hands, which he could have done. An emperor am I, says Daniel, and next year I shall be a knight of the queen. All right, Dan, says I, but come along now while there's time. It's your fault, says he, for not looking after your army better. There was mutiny in the midst, and you didn't know you damned engine driving, plate laying, missionaries pass hunting hound. He sat upon a rock and called me every foul name he could lay tongue to. I was too heartsick to care, though it was all his foolishness that brought the smash. I'm sorry, Dan, says I, but there's no accounting for natives. This business is our 57. Maybe we'll make something out of it yet, when we've got to Bashkai. Let's get to Bashkai, then, says Dan, and, by God, when I come back here again I'll sweep the valley so there isn't a bug in a blanket left. We walked all that day, and all that night Dan was stumping up and down on the snow, chewing his beard and muttering to himself. There's no hope o' getting clear, said Billy Fish. The priests will have sent runners to the villages to say that you are only men. Why didn't you stick on as gods till things was more settled? I'm a dead man, says Billy Fish and he throws himself down on the snow and begins to pray to his gods. Next morning we was in a cruel bad country all up and down, no level ground at all, and no food either. The six Bashkai men looked at Billy Fish hungry wise as if they wanted to ask something, but they said never a word. At noon we came to the top of a flat mountain all covered with snow, and when we climbed up into it, behold, there was an army in position waiting in the middle. The runners have been very quick says Billy Fish, with a little bit of a laugh. They are waiting for us. Three or four men began to fire from the enemy's side, and a chance shot took Daniel in the calf of the leg. That brought him to his senses. He looks across the snow at the army, and sees the rifles that we had brought into the country. We're done for, says he. They are Englishmen, these people, and it's my blasted nonsense that has brought you to this. Get back. Billy Fish, and take your men away, you've done what you could, and now cut for it. Carnahan, says he, shake hands with me and go along with Billy. Maybe they won't kill you. I'll go and meet em alone. It's me that did it. Me, the king. Go, says I go to hell, Dan. I'm with you here. Billy Fish, you clear out, and we too will meet those folk. I'm a chief says Billy Fish, quite quiet. I stay with you. My men can go. The Bashkai fellows didn't wait for a second word but ran off, and Dan and me and Billy Fish walked across to where the drums were drumming and the horns were horning. It was cold awful cold. I've got that cold in the back of my head now. There's a lump of it there. The Punkakulis had gone to sleep. Two kerosene lamps were blazing in the office and the perspiration poured down my face and splashed on the blotter as I leaned forward. Carnahan was shivering, and I feared that his mind might go. I wiped my face, took a fresh grip of the piteously mangled hands, and said what happened after that. 
the momentary shift of my eyes had broken the clear current. What was you pleased to say, whined Carnahan. They took them without any sound. Not a little whisper all along the snow, not though the king knocked down the first man that set hand on him not though old Peachy fired his last cartridge into the brown of M. Not a single solitary sound did those swines make. They just closed up, tight, and I tell you their first stunk. There was a man called Billy Fish, a good friend of us all, and they cut his throat, sir, then and there, like a pig, and the king kicks up the bloody snow and says we've had a dashed fine run for our money. What's coming next? But Peachy, Peachy Talia Pharaoh, I tell you, sir, in confidence as betwixt two friends, he lost his head, sir. No, he didn't neither. The king lost his head, so he did, all along a one of those cunning rope bridges. Kindly let me have the paper cutter, sir. It tilted this way. They marched him a mile across that snow to a rope bridge over a ravine with a river at the bottom. You may have seen such. They prodded him behind like an ox. Damn your eyes, says the king. Do you suppose I can't die like a gentleman? He turns to Peachy Peachy that was crying like a child. I've brought you to this, Peachy, says he. Brought you out of your happy life to be killed in Kafir Ristan, where you was late commander-in-chief of the emperor's forces. Say you forgive me, Peachy. I do, says Peachy. Fully and freely do I forgive you, Dan. Shake hands, Peachy, says he. I'm going now. Out he goes looking neither right nor left, and when he was plumb in the middle of those dizzy dancing ropes, cut, you beggars, he shouts, and they cut, and old Dan fell, turning round and round and round, twenty thousand miles, for he took half an hour to fall till he struck the water, and I could see his body caught on a rock with the gold crown close beside. But do you know what they did to Peachy between two pine trees? They crucified him, sir as Peachy's hands will show. They used wooden pegs for his hands and his feet, and he didn't die. He hung there and screamed, and they took him down next day, and said it was a miracle that he wasn't dead. They took him down poor old Peachy that hadn't done them any harm that hadn't done them any. He rocked to and fro and wept bitterly, wiping his eyes with the back of his scarred hands and moaning like a child for some ten minutes. They was cruel enough to feed him up in the temple, because they said he was more of a god than old Daniel that was a man. Then they turned him out on the snow, and told him to go home, and Peachy came home in about a year, begging along the roads quite safe, for Daniel Dravit he walked before and said come along, Peachy. It's a big thing we're doing. The mountains they danced at night, and the mountains they tried to fall on Peachy's head, but Dan he held up his hand, and Peachy came along bent double. He never let go of Dan's hand, and he never let go of Dan's head. They gave it to him as a present in the temple, to remind him not to come again, and though the crown was pure gold, and Peachy was starving, never would Peachy sell the same. You knew Dravit, sir. You knew right worshipful brother Dravit. Look at him now. He fumbled in the mass of rags round his bent waist, brought out a black horsehair bag embroidered with silver thread and shook therefrom onto my table the dried, withered head of Daniel Dravit. The morning sun that had long been paling the lamps struck the red beard and blind sunken eyes, struck, too, a heavy circlet of gold studded with raw turquoises, that Carnahan placed tenderly on the battered temples. You behold now, said Carnahan, the emperor in his habit as he lived the king of Kafir Ristan with his crown upon his head. Poor old Daniel that was a monarch once. I shuddered, for, in spite of defacements manifold, I recognized the head of the man of Merwar Junction. Carnahan rose to go. I attempted to stop him. He was not fit to walk abroad. Let me take away the whiskey, and give me a little money, he gasped. I was a king once. I'll go to the deputy commissioner and ask to set in the poorhouse till I get my health. No, thank you. I can't wait till you get a carriage for me. I've urgent private affairs in the south at Merwar. He shambled out of the office and departed in the direction of the deputy commissioner's house. 
That day at noon I had occasion to go down the blinding hot mall, and I saw a crooked man crawling along the white dust of the roadside, his hat in his hand, quavering dolorously after the fashion of street singers at home. There was not a soul in sight, and he was out of all possible earshot of the houses. And he sang through his nose, turning his head from right to left. The son of man goes forth to war. A golden crown to gain. His blood-red banner streams afar. Who follows in his train? I waited to hear no more, but put the poor wretch into my carriage and drove him off to the nearest missionary for eventual transfer to the asylum. He repeated the hymn twice while he was with me whom he did not in the least recognize, and I left him singing to the missionary. Two days later I inquired after his welfare of the superintendent of the asylum. He was admitted suffering from sunstroke. He died early yesterday morning, said the superintendent. Is it true that he was half an hour bareheaded in the sun at midday? Yes, said I, but do you happen to know if he had anything upon him by any chance when he died? Not to my knowledge, said the superintendent. And there the matter rests. The End The Summary of The Man Who Would Be King by Rudyard Kipling In the captivating and perilous landscapes of 19th century India, the extraordinary saga of Daniel Dravet and Peachy Carnahan unfolds. These two former British soldiers turned audacious adventurers dared to dream beyond the confines of reason and ambition. Their quest led them deep into the treacherous Himalayas, where the air was thin, the mountains formidable, and the local people steeped in ancient legends. Armed with little more than courage, they ventured into Kafiristan, a remote and enigmatic land. In Kafiristan, the two adventurers achieved the unimaginable. Revered as gods, they built a kingdom, amassed wealth, and lived lives filled with opulence. Dravet, in an act of love and defiance, took a local woman as his wife, cementing their divine status. But every ambition that reaches for the heavens carries a shadow of downfall. Dravet's insatiable thirst for godlike power led to his inevitable undoing. When the people saw him bleed, their faith in him crumbled. Chaos reigned, and in the midst of it all, Dravet made a fatal mistake that sealed his tragic fate. Only one man survived to recount this extraordinary tale the British journalist who had observed their audacious journey from the start. As he reflects on the consequences of unchecked ambition and the seductive allure of power, he leaves us with a haunting lesson that echoes through time. The Man Who Would Be King is a narrative that beckons us into a world of adventure, desire, and the relentless pursuit of immortality. It's a story of humanity's vulnerability when faced with the intoxicating promises of power and the inescapable truths of mortality. As you delve into these pages, prepare to embark on a journey that will seize your imagination, your heart, and your very soul. The Man Who Would Be King by Rudyard Kipling offers several key learning points and themes that can be gleaned from the story. 1. Ambition and Hubris The novella explores the consequences of unchecked ambition and hubris. Dravet and Carnahan's desire to become kings and gods ultimately leads to their downfall. Their overconfidence and disregard for the consequences of their actions highlight the dangers of unbridled ambition. 2. Imperialism and Cultural Understanding The story touches on themes of imperialism and cultural misunderstanding. Dravet and Carnahan, as British adventurers, attempt to impose their beliefs and authority on the people of Kafiristan without fully understanding the local culture and traditions, leading to tragic consequences. 3. The Fragility of Power The Man Who Would Be King illustrates the fragility of power and the ephemeral nature of authority. Dravet's perceived godhood crumbles when his mortality is exposed, revealing how quickly power can shift and vanish. 4. Friendship and Loyalty the enduring friendship between Dravet and Carnahan is a central theme. Their loyalty to each other is both their strength and, ultimately, their downfall. Their unwavering support and camaraderie are powerful elements of the story. 5. The Price of Deception The novella explores the consequences of deception and manipulation. Dravet and Carnahan's initial deceit, pretending to be gods, sets the stage for the events that follow leading to a tragic unraveling of their empire. 6. Mortality and Humanity The story grapples with themes of mortality and the nature of humanity. 
Dravit's revelation of mortality serves as a stark reminder of human limitations and the inescapable reality of death. 7. Narrative Perspective Kipling's choice of a first-person narrator, the British journalist, allows for a critical perspective on the events. This narrative device emphasizes the story's themes and underscores the consequences of Dravit and Carnahan's actions. 8. Colonialism and British Imperialism the novella indirectly comments on British colonialism and imperialism in India and neighbouring regions. It raises questions about the impact of British rule and the sometimes misguided ambitions of colonial adventurers. These key learning points and themes in The Man Who Would Be King make it a thought-provoking work that invites readers to reflect on the complexities of human ambition, power, friendship, and the consequences of cultural clashes in a colonial context. Thank you for listening.